Welcome to DivCasts from University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Uh, the other speaker is Terry Gee, who teaches in both history and physics at Brigham Young University, Idaho. She was educated, educated at Utah State and with a master's and PhD from the History of Science program at the University of Toronto. Um, her dissertation there was entitled Strategies of Defending Astrology, a Continuing Tradition, and it looked at the origins of a rationalized astrology going back to Ptolemy and then on forward through Abu Mashar in medieval Islam and Roger Bacon in medieval Europe. Uh, she's interested in medieval Islam, specifically astronomy, astronomy and astrology, but also the history of science more broadly in Islam, and the general history of astronomy and issues of the transmission of knowledge. And her title today is Astrology versus Astronomy in Abu Mashar's Kitab al-Mahdal al-Kavir. Um, her discussant is Nora Jacobson Ben Hamad from the Divinity School here at the University of Chicago where she's a third year PhD student in Islamic studies. Uh, she focuses on medieval Islamic philosophy and theology and means to write a dissertation on the works of Fakir al-Din al-Razi. Um, so, as I say, uh, 40 minutes for the speaker, then 10 minutes for discussant, um, five minutes discussant speaker, then brief factual questions, and then we'll move on to Terry Gee and go through the same protocol with her and her discussant. And then there's a 30-minute Q&A, general Q&A that's scheduled. And I'm going to vacate the table. Sure, you, and I'll thank you. It down. <clears throat> uh, all right, so uh, the boundary between astronomy and astrology has often been blurred, as we have seen throughout this conference. While the two are firmly separated today, that is a relatively recent development. Many authors from antiquity through the late Middle Ages have studied and defined the two disciplines. For example, in Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos, astrology is a type of prognostication, which he defines as one of the means of prediction through astronomy, or that in which, by the means of the natural character of the characters of these aspects themselves, we investigate the changes which they bring about in that which they surround. The other, it's first both in order and in effectiveness, and it's desirable in itself. Its focus is the movement of the planets and the stars. While he specifies that they are two different disciplines, both are, dif are types of prediction through astronomy. The difference is in what is being predicted. In the case of astrology, it is predicting the events of the celestial realm on the terrestrial realm. In the case of what we would define as astronomy today, the predictions are made of how the planets will be moving in the future. The terms astronomia and astrologia have been used interchangeably throughout classical and medieval history for both astronomy and astrology. A few scholars, such as Isidore of Seville, have made an attempt to assign each word to a single practice, but that was not the norm. In the medieval Islamic world, specifically in the works of Abu Mashar that I will be focusing on, Astrology is the science of the judgments of the stars, ilm al najum, while astronomy is defined as the science of the whole, ilm al which covers the study of the quantity and the quality of the celestial spheres, the planets, their shapes and sizes, the velocities, in short, the observable, observable facts about the sky. This, Abu Mashar states, is the science which Ptolemy describes in the Almagest. In the medieval Islamic world, even before the works of Abu Mashar, we can see that astrology's position and purpose was an uncertain one. One might assume that the main attacks on astrology were religious objections because of the issues of free will and the role of God when the movements of stars can be a cause for change in the human beings. However, the earliest religious writings were not as dogmatic in their rejection of astrology. For example, in the early tafsir, we can see some commentators actually used astrological events to explain events in the Quran, acknowledging that astrology could be valid, but did not assume that they would control mankind's actions. Instead of rejecting astrology on religious grounds, it was rejected due to perceived scientific deficiencies. Similarly, early astrologers were not concerned with the possibility of religious backlash to what they wrote. In fact, uh, the famous 9th century astrologer, Masha'Allah, 
presented a horoscope which predicted a loss of faith and a degeneration of morals due to a planetary conjunction. This is a clear movement into religious territory. There could be a real risk in ascribing such power to the heavens because it seems to overcome the omnipotence of God. But the earliest writings about astrology do not address that issue. Even Kalam writers uh, demonstrate a different method of attacking the practice other than the issues due to religious conflict. Some early refutations by the Mutakelemun were focused on astrology's inherent errors, not on its religious implications. Uh, Fadl ibn Marwan, writing in the mid-9th century, attacked astrology on the basis of astrologers being unable to, quote, determine the structure of the universe. His contemporary, Al-Jahiz, uh, wrote that the predictions of astrologers cannot measure up to revelation from prophets, even if astrological prediction has some validity. Revelation, unlike astrology, does not require evidence or observation. It comes directly from God. Thus, at best, astrology can only be a pale imitation of revelation. The rejection of astrology was based on its lack of validity, not on possible dangers to religious belief. However, this beginning did not remain the case as the foreign sciences became more popular. In the 9th and 10th centuries, attacks on astrology began, began to come from a different quarter. The rise of a new science called El Malahaya, the science of the configuration, demonstrates an emerging need to separate astrology from astronomy, and predominantly this did not come from religious attackers, but from the philosophers and mathematicians. While there is no doubt that astrology was attacked by religious scholars, philosophers were the driving force behind this determined division of astronomy and astrology. Abu Mashar defended astrology not in religious terms, but in philosophical terms. In fact, he cites the philosopher numerous times in his defense, meaning Aristotle, as well as Ptolemy, whom he calls wise, the wise, uh, for philosophers and mathematicians, connecting philosophy with astrology was the problem. Astrology was one of the foreign sciences, and while Al-Kindi famously has stated that those seeking for truth should not, uh, quote, be ashamed of appreciating the truth and of acquiring it from wherever it comes, even if it comes from races distant and nations different from us, the fact remains that these possible sources of truth came from outside Islam, and for some this was an issue. It was, an, it was important that those studying the foreign sciences present them in the best possible terms. The many objections to astrology created an Achilles heel through which one could launch attacks against these imported foreign sciences and philosophies. Numerous attacks on astrology were published contemporary with and after Abu Mashar's works. Mathematicians and philosophers, as members of those practicing the foreign sciences, condemned astrology both on grounds of its lack of validity and its tarnishing of the other foreign sciences. Saliba states that with a single exception, no philosopher of any repute would defend astrology. And this seems to have been the common attitude of the intellectual elite. One of the earliest groups of scholars to acknowledge a definite difference between astrology and astronomy is the Ikhwan Safa, which we'll hear a lot more about later today. Uh, this enigmatic group left behind a number of epistles published in the 10th century, which allows us to reconstruct their system of thought. Their intention was to create an encyclopedia of knowledge, meaning that they addressed most of the sciences being studied in the Islamic world at the time. In the third epistle of the Rusail, the brethren discuss the science of the stars and divide it into three parts. The first is Ilm al Haya, the second encompasses astronomical tables and calendars, the creation of sieges, the third is Ilm al Ahkam, the science of the judgments. In spite of this apparently simple division, the concepts of astrology cannot be wholly separated from the first type. Astronomy was a popular topic for the Ikhwan Safa. The three separate epistles were written exclusively about the science of the stars because of the idea that the stars, the science of the stars is, origi is originally a revealed science and because the influence of the heavens affects every aspect of the sublunar realm. Thus, in the Rasail, the purpose of the division appears to be for the sake of clarity rather than to protect astronomy. Epistle 3 contains a defense of astrology along with the explication of the lunar mansions, zodiacal signs, and aspects. One of the evidences for a connection between mankind and the heavens comes in Epistle 2. In discussing the place of man in the creation, the brethren state that, quote, since man is a combination of a corporeal body and a spiritual soul, 
they found correspondences in the construction of his body at, with all existing things in the corporeal world, the marvelous composition of its spheres, the divisions of its zodiacal signs, the movement of its stars. However, in spite of their defense of these types of astrology, the Ikhwana Safa were less sympathetic to the type of astrology associated with predicting events. In Epistle 1, they state that astrology cannot claim to predict what will come. Anyone who tries to claim that role for astrology is wrong. In fact, what they call the science of the unseen is really the science of indetermination. The gratuitous pretension of anticipating the future without recourse to any symptom or reasoning, be it causal or deductive. In this sense, the unknown is accessible neither to the astrologers, nor diviners, nor prophets, nor sages. It is the work of God only. While they accept the idea of celestial influence on the earth, the brethren are dismissive of anyone who would claim to be able to predict it. In addition, even if prediction is possible, prevention is not. Only God can do anything to change what will happen. The influence of the planets is possible only through the power of God. They do not have power in and of themselves. Contemporary with Dorasail, the Firist of Ibn al Nadim describes the two sciences as Ilm al Haya and Ilm al Ahkam, that is, astronomy and astrology, respectively. Saliba notes that it is only in the 10th century that al Haya begins to be applied consistently to astronomy as a way of separating it from astrology. It is impossible to say who began this practice, but it appears to have been embraced by many of the scholars scholars of the foreign sciences as a way of divesting ast astronomy of the possible corruption to be found within its sister science astrology. For example, the famed 11th century astronomer Al-Biruni wrote a handbook on the practice of astrology, Kitab al-Tafhim, at the request of Rehana, the daughter of Al-Hassan, in order to assist in her instruction. But even though this text is teaching about the practices of astrology and the knowledge needed to understand it, Al-Biruni also gives his opinion of the art. He says, by the majority of, the, of people, the decrees of the stars are regarded as belonging to the exact sciences, while my confidence in their results and in the profession resembles that of the least of them. Although he does not completely dismiss astrology, he does place it on the lowest level of the sciences, giving the impression that the attention it receives is wasted. Al-Biruni also seems to distance himself from the practice. He may be writing a guide for it, but he himself is not one of the astrologers. Much of the handbook is simply relaying the methods, but in those places which require additional commentary, Al-Biruni generally writes of what astrologers say, not what he says. Al-Biruni's views on astrology are much more openly negative in other works, including the Atar al -Bak I'm sorry, Bakhtiya, in which he attacks astrologers as those who, quote, excite suspicion against and bring discredit upon astronomers and mathematicians by counting themselves among their ranks and by presenting themselves as professors of their art, although they cannot even impose upon anybody who has only the slightest degree of scientific training. Able to give his own opinion, Alberuni is decidedly against astrology and its practitioners. As other philosophers had, he accuses astrologers of harming the other foreign sciences by claiming to be one of them. The worst damage astrologers could do was by associating themselves with astronomy. In addition to the works specifically on astronomy or astrology, the classification of astrology within the hierarchy of the sciences demonstrates its uncertain position as one of the foreign sciences. The practice of classifying the sciences was common, as we have heard already. The purpose of these varied classifications seems to have been to demonstrate a hierarchy of science as well as how the sciences fit together. The authors were not confined to any one group. The famed mathematician and philosopher Al-Kindi wrote one of the earliest surviving partial classifications, but the 11th century jurist and theologian Al-Ghazali also wrote a famous classification of the sciences. In these classifications, it is possible to see how astrology fit with the other sciences. For example, Al-Kindi divides the sciences into those which are divine, that is, received by revelation, and those that are human, that is, philosophy. Coming directly from God, the divine sciences are obviously higher quality than the human sciences. However, the human sciences are above simple knowledge, in part because of the effort required to master them. It is in this group of sciences that we find the science of the stars. And according to Al-Kindi, astronomy is one of the more complicated subjects. Unfortunately, we do not have a complete enumeration of the sciences from Al-Kindi, but what we have demonstrates a common division. Knowledge from God versus knowledge from philosophy. 
Similarly, the Ikhwana Safa, while not presenting a formal classification, did devote one epistle to explain the organization of the sciences in Islam. They divide the sciences into three parts, the introductory sciences, which include a number of grammatical sciences, the religious sciences, and last, the true philosophical sciences. As Al-Kindi did, they place the science of the stars in philosophy, specifically with the mathematical sciences. Slightly later, also in the 10th century, the Al-Farabi wrote the earliest complete classification, one which had considerable influence on those who came after him. Like Al-Kindi, he set up a hierarchy, and the top of that hierarchy, hierarchy is contained, uh, is taken by knowledge which comes from divine revelation. Al-Farabi lived at the peak of the translation period when the foreign sciences were enjoying a great deal of attention and study. As such, his perception of them gives an interesting glimpse into some of the attitudes during the 9th and 10th centuries in Baghdad. In terms of perfection, celestial objects are below both God and angels, but are above terrestrial objects. Thus, the study of the heavens is elevated above the study of the earth. In addition, Al-Farabi considered celestial objects to be mathematical in nature, and in describing the study of the heavens, he uses the term al-hayat to describe it. Like the Ikhwan, he divided the science of the stars into astronomy and astrology. Thus, they are sister sciences, both describing the heavens and both fitting under the mathematical sciences. But astrology is not even close to the same as astronomy. Rather, he wished to demonstrate that while astronomy is an exact science, judicial astrology is not, and its practitioners are often frauds. It is in this context that we find the work of the famous astrologer Abu Mashar, the author of Kitab al-Madkhal al-Kabir, or the great introduction to the science of the judgments of the stars. He was born in or near the city of Balkh, located in modern-day Afghanistan in 787. The city was home to people of Greek, Indian, Chinese, and Scythian origin, as well as follower, followers of Judaism, Nestorian Christian, Christianity, the Manichaeans, and that of the dominant religion of Zoroastrian, Zoroastrianism, which we heard about yesterday. Um, placing Abu Mashar in a multicultural region with beliefs and cultures sympathetic to the tenets of astrology. This region was also a source of many of the Abbasid intellectuals and translators in spite of the pro-Iranian and anti-Arab attitude which was prevalent during the early years of the Abbasid dynasty. Abu Mashar was, according to Ibn al-Nadim, first a scholar of the Hadith and came to Baghdad at the beginning of the reign of al-Ma'mun on his way to Mecca for the Hajj, a journey which he actually never completed. While in Baghdad, he became acquainted with uh, al-Munajim, an astrologer well-connected to the Caliph al-Mutawakkil, and learned from him and his library. Abu Mashar also became a part of the Arabic intellectual milieu and met al-Kindi, to whom he was initially antagonistic because of his devotion to philosophy, meaning that Abu Mashar was possibly a conservative religious scholar. He did not begin studying the judgments of the stars until he was 47 years old, after a brief foray into geometry and arithmetic, apparently instigated by al-Kindi himself as a challenge. Other stories of Abu Mashar's conversion to astrology relate that he studied the discipline until he became an atheist, lured away from his religious studies by Al-Kindi and his mathematics. As Saliba notes, it was not the arithmetic and geometry which were to be rejected. Rather, astrology was presented as a subject which had the ability to draw one away from the worship of God. The anecdote of Abu Mashar's atheism reveals the risk faced by those who studied the foreign sciences. It was easy to argue that those who studied them would lose their faith, as demonstrated by a famous astrologer like Abu Mashar. It was in the best interests of the advocates of the foreign sciences to push astrology far away from philosophy. Abu Mashar's Kitab al-Madkhal al-Kabir is widely considered to be one of the, most influential, one of the more influential uh, medieval astrological texts. It was vital for astrology in Islam and was significant in medieval Europe as well, after being translated into Latin at least twice. The structure of Kitab al-Madkhal al-Kabir is similar to that of other works on astrology, both before and after its publication. The work is divided into eight books. Each book is further divided into sections. Book one is the introduction in which Abu Mashar presents his defense of astrology, his aims in writing it, the ways in which it is beneficial, and how it relates to other practices. Books two through eight address the various aspects of astrology, from the signs of the zodiac and the different spheres surrounding the earth, to the planets, their aspects, and powers, to the more technical parts of astrology, for example, the houses, exaltations, lots, and how they function in the casting of a horoscope. 
Abu Mashar uses the whole of the introduction of his Kitab al-Madhal al-Kabir to present the most thorough extent defense of astrology in the Islamic world. This is where he lays out his ideas about the efficacy and validity of astrology and his arguments against those who would deride astrology as a falsity. The introduction itself is divided into six parts. The first is a brief introduction and summary of what the book covers. The second part is on the existence of the judgments, al-Ahkam. In it, Abu Masha presents the beginning of his defense of astrology and makes a number of comparisons between astrology and other arts. The third part describes how the stars operate in the world, that is, the manner in which influence arises and of what type it is. The fourth section describes the importance of the various forms of the planets and stars. Essentially, the shape of the planets and the composition of them is what imparts their innate properties and, by extension, what power and influence they have on the Earth. Part five is organized based on Abu Mashar's replies to what he describes as the various methods used to attra attack astrology. There are 10 groups of people he responds to. Those who simply say that the planets are not signs of the events on the earth. Those who say that the planets are signs, but not of individuals. The philosophers who argue that the planets cannot show the possible. Those who know astronomy and dismiss astrology because of their supposed knowledge. Those who dismiss astrology because knowledge of it can only come from experience. The mathematicians who look at zijas and dismiss astrology because some of the zijas are wrong. Those who are simply envious of the success of skilled astrologers. Those who pretend to be doctors but do not really understand their art. Those who are simply ignorant of astrology. And finally, those of the general public who see and dismiss those who claim knowledge but really possess no understanding of the planets. Abu Mashar presents each group's arguments and then summarily dismisses them, putting more emphasis on those which he considers to be more important or more important arguments. Part six describes how astrology is a useful practice, one to be encouraged and not dismissed. Abu Mashar again uses a number of examples and analogies to support his claim. The conclusion of his defense is a brief summary of the main points. Although Abu Mashar lived during the ninth century, well before we see the formal use of the term ilm al-haya, the beginnings of this division were already in place, and it seems clear from his arguments that he was aware of it. What is interesting about Abu Mashar's approach, however, is that he does not argue against this division. There is no indication that he wishes to keep the two sciences together as one, although he does maintain that there is a connection between them. However, he uses the same separation advocated by those who dislike astrology to elevate it above astronomy. In the remainder of this talk, I will show how the separation of astronomy and astrology was used by Abu Mashar to show the importance of astrology and to demonstrate that it is astrology, not astronomy, that has value in itself. In spite of the rejection of astrology by philosophers, mathematicians, and astronomers, Abu Mashar has taken that rejection and used it to his advantage in defending astrology. As mentioned earlier, Abu Mashar cites Ptolemy in his text, calling him Ptolemy the Wise. While he thinks that the author of the Almagest and the author of the Tetrabiblos are actually two different people, he still believes that the author of the Tetrabiblos is a very learned man. Ptolemy's distinction possibly has to do, um, Ptolemy's distinction in the Tetrabiblos possibly has to do with the need to separate his work on astronomy, the Almagest, which he references in the introduction, from his work on astrology, the Tetrabiblos. Abu Mashar's separation is focused on the types of knowledge which come from both, but he also mentions the use of analogies or syllogisms, qiyasat, um, in connection with both, saying that astronomy is found by observation, but what is not found visually must be accepted by analogy because the meanings and proofs of it arise from clear evidence. And similarly, astrological knowledge comes from what is perceptible, but what is imperceptible is shown by clear analogies from the science of the natures of things and what appears to, uh, from, the motions of, from the power of the motions of the, of the planets. The validity of both sciences should be obvious, but when it is not, the use of analogy proves it beyond doubt with the result that only those who resist the truth or who are distant from knowledge are able to reject it. In section two of his introduction, Abu Mashar presents his view of the world in general and of astrology and astronomy specifically. Abu Mashar maintains the separation of the two sciences, saying that there are two types of knowledge which can come from the study of the stars. Obviously, this is the same basic division that we saw 
in the Ikhwan al-Safa, al-Farabi, and al-Kindi. But Abu Mashar uses a different term for astronomy, and his approach to the importance of this separation demonstrates how his view of astrology differs from that of his contemporaries and those scholars who came after him. The first of the sciences of the stars is the science of the whole, as I mentioned before, ilm al-Kul, which is focused on the observable facts about the sky. It is the science of Ptolemy's Almagest and is found by means of clear, indisputable evidence which comes from the science of arithmetic and of geometry and of surveying. Doubt does not mix with it and the senses accept it. This science is not refuted unless one resists the truth. This appears to be the same kind of attitude that I've already demonstrated as being common in other texts. It would be easy to assume that astronomy has maintained its preeminence in Abu Mashar's view. To continue his description, the second science is the science of the judgments, or astrology, and it relies on the first science. Again, this is very similar to the common view of the relationship of astronomy and astrology. If the analysis stopped here, there would be nothing to differentiate Abu Mashar's approach from any other scholar. Abu Mashar described the science as the natural knowledge of each planet and each sphere and the property of their meaning and what occurs due to the power of their different movements and their nature. Like astronomy, the science of the whole, astrology relies on clear analogies, or syllogisms, and on the understood powers of the planetary motions and the effect of their distance on the Earth. This is where we see the first possibility of a different point of view. Abu Mashar appears to take it for granted that the motions of the, of the planets have power in them. He also describes those who would try and reject or refute this science as those who are distant from knowledge, common sense, and from the knowledge of the conditions of the celestial bodies. Only someone who was completely ignorant of reality could deny the validity of astrology. In fact, those who attack astrology do not understand astronomy either. This does not mean that astronomy does not lead one to truth. Abu Mashar describes both sciences as resulting in knowledge, and people who would refute either one as ignorant of or of ignoring truth. However, astrology, in Abu Mashar's view, is a genuine way to truth and is learned from those who came before. By studying the movements of the planets in depth, astrologers may draw important conclusions of what the planets do in the changing of the seasons and of the natures of things on Earth. <clears throat> Abu Mashar also states that, quote, the science as the second science, astrology, is the fruit of the first science, astronomy, because the wise man, if he knows the quality of the movements of the spheres and the planets and their quantity, the result is that he knows what the power of those movements show and, states, and the states of the things in the world. And if he does not know what the planets signify by their movements, then the first type of the science of the stars has no result. Without astrology, astronomy is useless. The word thamara, which I have translated as result, implies something positive, a benefit. Astronomy gives nothing unless it is applied to astrology. For Abu Mashar, astrology is the purpose of studying astronomy and the two sciences are inseparably connected no matter how intent some scholars would be in trying to separate them. However, this connection is due to the need for astronomy to have astrology justify its study not because astrology needs astronomy to justify its place as one of the sciences. Abu Mashar does not stop there in elevating astrology. In part five of his defense, in which he takes on 10 types of, cri of critics of astrology, the sixth group is made up of those mathematicians who see the errors present in the zijas used to make predictions. According to Abu Mashar, they present two arguments against astrology. The first is that the estimations used by the astrologers create an error in the locations of the planets, and the second is that the different zijas are not in agreement, and thus the astrologers cannot make the same prediction if they are using a different zij. The errors uh, uh, make the art of astrology false. If astrology is true, it should not create such errors as this. Abu Mashar's rebuttal is also twofold. First, there are so many different factors made involved in making predictions that even though errors do exist, it does not make the predictions false because the errors are not large enough to put off the locations of the planets by any significant amount. The use of estimation rather than exactitude actually helps the art of astrology achieve greater accuracy. Second, the true practitioner of astrology will understand the movements of the stars and will know thoroughly their effects and what is shown from their natures and properties and will know their arrival at the locations of each in each constellation. 
If one among them does not know the truth of that, the fault of that ignorance is attributable to that practitioner because he is ignorant of what is necessary for him to teach from his art. It is to be desired to be as accurate as possible, of course, and Abu Mashar advocates the use of instruments to create more accurate tables, but he does not attribute errors to the uncertainty of astrology itself, only to its general complexity and shortcomings in the practitioners. One of the interesting side notes of this argument is that Abu Mashar's rebuttal is also somewhat derisive towards those who create the zijas to the exclusion of all else. Since astronomy is confined to the mere collation of data rather than any kind of actual analysis. The implication is that even with the presence of errors, the astrologers are pursuing a more valuable practice because there is actual ac application. He has already described astrology as being the highest and noblest of the sciences, but here he is lifting it even above astronomy. Abu Mashar's intention is to show that astrology is what makes astronomy worth studying. As he stated in his refutation of the fourth group of critics in section five, the two sciences are connected to each other. The height of the celestial spheres and their nobility makes it likely that they have an influence on the sublunar realm. Even those who try, who try to deny the validity of astrology cannot fully escape the fact that the heavens do have an influence on the earth. The seasons are clearly caused by the heavens. One cannot simply study astronomy and ignore the obvious effects from the heavens. <clears throat> um, quote, and they say that it is his duty who looks after the first type of the sciences to look after the second type of it, because they are related sciences, the one with the other, and the second science is the fruit of the first science, because since he knows the quality of the movements of the spheres and the planets and their quantity, the wise man also knows what the power of those movements show and states of the things existing in this world. If he does not know what the planets signify by their movements, then the first type of the science of the stars has no result, and the state of those people who look at the first science, who do not know this science connected to it, are as the state of people who have medications and prepared remedies, and they do not know how to use them. And those medications and remedies among the treatments are not as useful for anything and rejecting illness. This quotation shows a different perspective from Ptolemy's stated position in the Tetrabiblos, that is, that astronomy is desirable in itself, even though it does not attain the result given by its combination with the second, and that astrology never attains the sureness of the first unvarying science. Abu Mashar states that without astrology, astronomy has no purpose, and the people who study only astronomy have lost all the value in studying the stars and do not understand what benefits they are missing through their rejection. He continues, Likewise, those men also know the conditions of the planets and their locations among the constellations, and they do not know of anything which each planet shows in its constellation and in its condition. Those men produce in their rejection this second type of the science of the stars only. They do not apply their minds to it. They reject it because if they confirmed it, the people would find fault with them by their omission of its knowledge. And it is said by them that there are two types of the science. One of them is connected with the other, but they present one as better than the other, and they do not depict the other in a favorable light. These critics are also are so determined to separate astronomy and astrology that they try to make the one better than the other without understanding the connection between them. This seems to be an obvious reference to the development of Ilm al-Haya. Abu Mashar is criticizing those who refuse to even, even to study astrology because they will not acknowledge the possibility of any value in it. Instead, they will allow that both are sciences of, of the stars, but that astronomy is the science that has value. Astrology does not. In order to refute this attitude, Abu Mashar's intention is to make astrology indispensable to astronomy, to the extent that without it, astronomy has no value, unlike uh, Ptolemy's astronomy. Astrology gives astronomy meaning, so those who would attempt to remove it from the Iman Anajum, as Ibn Sina would do in a later work, are also removing the purpose of, those, of the science of the stars. Abu Mashar's closing arguments are, are a review of previous points he has made in his defense of astrology. People always use foreknowledge gained from experience. Like doctors who practice medicine, astrologers study the stars in order to understand what is coming with the intent of helping their clients. However, astrology is better than medicine because, 
Quote, doctors infer things from the nature of the seasons, changes from state to state, from ephemeral, ephemeral and tangible things. As for the astrologers, they make inferences about living th beings from the celestial bodies and from what happens to, to the seasons and the natures due to the power of these motions. The astrologers also infer from what was in ancient times, while the doctor infers what is in one season of the year or in one hour of the day. He rarely can know what has passed. Being able to predict from celestial objects, which are perfect and unchanging, results in better knowledge than that garnered from the sublunar realm. Abu Mashar's intent is to present a science which is perfectly adapted for the use of mankind. The men who practice it are not all perfect at it, and the results do not always result in the possibility of change, but astrology speaks to the rational mind, that part of the soul of man which separates it from animals. He concludes his defense of astrology stating, that the, soul of, that the soul is the best thing in man, and it is happy with the knowledge of things that are and that were, but it is not happy with all the arts of knowledge or the knowledge of things past and present as it is with the art of the stars. The art of the stars, since it is better and foreknowledge of existing things comes from it, it is more beneficial than all the arts. Astrology is the greatest of all the arts because of its subject matter and its ability to give foreknowledge makes it the most valuable for human beings to possess. All through his defense of astrology, Abu Mashar elevates astrology above astronomy. He acknowledges the difficulty in practicing it and the errors which sometime, sometimes occur, but his main point is that far from being a subject which weakens the science of the stars, it gives the whole science meaning. Astrology is not only valuable, but it is the purpose of studying the heavens, and anything less than that is meaningless. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Professor Gee, for um, your paper, which focuses on such a key figure in the intellectual history of astrology. As someone who is not specialized in astrology, I appreciate the breadth of focus. Um, a number of points in your paper raise intriguing questions. I'm going to explore four, four lines of inquiry in this response. The first, I'm curious as to why Abu Mashar was so influential, given his personally late inception into the study of astrology at the age of 47, and the fact that he was seemingly not well versed in other philosophical sciences. His books became widespread and well cited, first of course in the Islamic world and later in medieval Christian Europe. Why do you think this is so? Are his works inherently valuable? That is, do you find that his analysis outstrips his peers? Or do you think that this is due to him being a forerunner who wrote extensively on a compelling subject? And this, I guess, would be in Arabic um, for the burgeoning Arabic Islamic empire. If Abu Mashur is the first great proponent of astrology after the beginning of the translation movement in the Arab world, do you have a sense of whether a wave of objection to astrology also cropped up at this time? Do you think that he is anticipating the particular objections stated by later thinkers that you cite, such as Al-Farabi and Al-Biruni? Or do you find evidence that he was already facing significant skeptics at this stage of the integration of astrology from a variety of sources into the Islamic empire? It seems that this same line of objections, namely that astrology is not worth pursuing simply because it doesn't work, um, are already at play in his time, given his responses to 10 categories of objectors regarding the efficacy of astrology. Given that astrology was already well developed in Persia, I wonder whether a division at the beginning of the translation movement is appropriate in this case. If the translation movement and Abu Masha's own work did help spread astrology into the Arabic geographical sections of the empire, then I wonder specifically about endemic Arabic responses to this influence if astrology had indeed not existed in the Arab world before this interaction. Sorry, I know it's a lot of questions. You can just, <laughs> your general thoughts on, on any one would be great. A second sub-question of this category thus connects to the first. Could you expand upon the specific ingenuity of Abu Mashr given the long history of development of astrology in a variety of cultural and linguistic contexts before this time? Um, thirdly, I was wondering also if you could elaborate on the argument that astrology held an uncertain status because it was a foreign science. What would you define as foreign in this context? Do you see evidence that astrology was viewed as foreign, given that Abu Mashr, himself born in Bech, 
seeks to re reveal a common heritage of this ancient art, pulling from the Middle Persian, ancient Greek, Indian sources mediated through Persian. I'm curious if there's any degree of discomfort with a non-Arabic origin that you detect in the works that you examine. Fourthly, um, and finally, Abu Mashad argues for the value of astrology based on an elevated consideration of techne, that is, the practical application of the intellectual inquiry into the movement of the heavens, astronomy. Indeed, he terms astrology the thamara, the fruit of the art of astronomy, as something that would benefit the human being, a decidedly anthrocentric view of the sciences, implying that knowledge and truth should exist in order to benefit humankind and granting them a dubious extrinsic value apart from that derived benefit. This was, in my understanding, an unusual viewpoint for a member of the intellectual elite of his time. As one might say, at this remarkable time to which we as scholars try to transport ourselves through imagination and discourse, those who cannot teach do. Further, the actual practice of astrology places him solidly within the social, the economic, and the political. His practice responds to expectations and incurs the consequences, painful or pleasurable, of positive prognostication or, inevitably, the prediction of calamity. Even the quotation that you cite in which he insists on the inability of any astrologer to predict with absolute certainty strikes me not only as responding to criticism from the learned elite, but also as a standard defense that he likely communicated to his clients. I wonder then about the role of power and prestige in influencing opinions presented on astrology and whether we can trust that those opinions are sincere. Given that Abu Mashid worked at the Abbasid court, one must consider the sway of comfort and reputation. What do you view as the role of patronage in the development of a lucrative art such as astrology? Thank you. All right, well, um, do you have an hour? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so obviously I can't answer all these questions in five minutes, but um, the question of why he's so influential, I think at least as far as his influence in um, in the Middle Ages in Europe has to at least partially to do just with the fact that it was translated and others weren't. I mean, it's, it just is one that has survived. Another part of it seems to be how thorough his defense is. He takes, it's about 1,500 lines, um, is how long, about how long, how many lines of Arabic text in LeMay's edition that he takes just to defend astrology. And he doesn't get into any of the details of how astrology works until his other books. And so I think part of the reason for how broad his influence is, is just how thorough he was in trying to um, defend his works and make sure that people understood that this is really important stuff that he's doing. Um, part of my, uh, of my dissertation was actually on how defenses are constructed, defenses of the sciences, specifically astrology. And it seems that Having a defense as your introduction is kind of a standard. Um, you can see it in a lot of, of Greek texts. You can see it in, in some of the Islamic texts. You can also see it in, um, the Middle Ages, in scientific texts in the Middle Ages. Um, but it does seem that because he does list these very specific groups, that he is responding directly to some kind of uh, existing skepticism at the time. Um, I, I can't prove it for sure, but it does seem that he is aware of this desire to start to separate, because he is in Baghdad. He's at the center of all of this translation that is going on, and so he would be aware of people who are trying to separate and pull apart these, this, and uh, divide the science of the stars. Um, I didn't mean to imply that he, that he didn't understand anything about astrology until he gets to Baghdad. Um, that's, there's some questions about his early life and wh whether or not the identification that Ibn Anadim gives him is actually the right one. Um, LeMay in particular questions that he was actually a religious scholar first. Um, he says that it's really more likely that Ibn Anadim, Ibn Anadim, yeah, sorry, I can't say his name today. Ibn Anadim um, was actually referencing another Abu Mashar who lived a century earlier. Um, and there is... There are also some anecdotes which refer to him, Abu Mashar, this Abu Mashar, as having done astrological predictions while he was in Balkh and before he goes to Baghdad. 
And so it, there's some question, um, there's even questions about his, the times that, where, when he was born and when he died. I've used just the typical of 787 to 886, but um, Yamamoto says that it, he, there are some evidences of predictions that he was making from 897, so that would be much later and that might push his dates later as well. So the translation movement, I think the impact was mostly making him aware of things like, there is an extensive um, Aristotelian section to his defense where he uses a lot of Aristotelian ideas to defend astrology as a valid practice. And um, that probably is, whether he was in astrology before he got to Baghdad or not, that probably is something he learned while he was in Baghdad, not, not in Balkh. Um, but again, that's, we're just, we just don't know for sure um, about that part. Let's see, do I still have time or should I stop there? Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so let's go down my list here. Um, Abu Mashar's defense is not particularly a work of ingenuity necessarily, but as I said before, it's so thorough. It's, he's so detailed in all of these things. He's like, well, some people say this, but this is why they're wrong. Some people say this, but this is why they're wrong. And he just takes all this time to say, any possible objection you might have, I've already thought of it and I can tell you why, this is not right. And I, I think that that's one of the things that helped it become so popular and also helped it survive. Um, these texts that are astrological texts, at least the ones that I have seen um, in, in ancient Greek, in medieval Islam, in medieval Europe, none of them actually tell you how to practice astrology. They're not actual practicing, these are all theoretical. It's like, it just is a list of all of the different aspects, I shouldn't use that word <laughs> when talking about astrology, all the different parts of astrology, including aspects, and how and what they mean. Um, and so you couldn't, you would have to learn it directly from a person, it seems like an actual scholar in order to, an actual astrologer, in order to learn how to practice it, because you couldn't with, not with Ptolemy's, not with, even not even with Vedius Valen's text, although his is closer to being a handbook, um, not with Abu Mashar's text. They are just not meant for that. And so what they're really meant for is to say, here is what astrology is and here's what it's all about. Uh, and that, and because he is so detailed with it, that is what really helps his work survive. Um, there's a reference um, al Kabisi makes to his own a work where he actually also defended astrology and he makes sense says if you want to know more about what I think about astrology I refer you to this text which unfortunately we don't have we just have we just know that he wrote it and which is very disappointing I wanted to be able to compare to see how they were how they compared but um, I haven't seen anything as detailed as Abu Mashar's defense in any of the um, astrological texts I've looked at that doesn't mean I've found them all but that is one thing that I have noticed. Um, let's see. Um, you actually brought up a really interesting point too about the this practical application and techne. I really hadn't thought of it in conjunction of techne in conjunction with what he was saying, simply because he is still trying to keep it esoteric, but that he is make, basically arguing that without practical application, there's no purpose. And um, I am not really sure about how that would fit in with the rest of the texts that I've looked at, because most of them that I've seen don't go into such detail. And so I don't know if that is a very common attitude amongst astrologers, because astrologers basically by their nature are working in something that has application. Um, but I, so I am really not sure that's something I would I would actually like to look into myself and see. That was a great point. I just, that's not something I can answer definitively. Um, how sincere he was, I can only assume that he wouldn't spend all this time. I mean, th there is of course something to be said for, this is job security, but um, he, he doesn't, I don't know that he would spend this much time trying to make it all perfect if he wasn't at least somewhat convinced. Because it seems to be either he spent from age 47 to the end of his life doing astrology, or he was doing it even before and so spending most of his life studying astrology, it seems that's something that, it is something that matters to him quite um, deeply and what the political stance of his position was, I can't say for sure. I, did I miss anything? 
But it's not actually so clear as it is if you look at the Renaissance. Because you know, you're looking back at things like Livy, the texts are different, the technologies are different. How much can you trust what these, these sources say? So I wonder, you know, is, there, is there something to be said about, uh, say, a, a local context of competition where the, the, the rival might not necessarily be with astronomers, but it might be with things like, sorry, you say chronicles, where, where uh, the, there are other grounds on which to offer useful predictive advice. And you, you, know, you might be tussling with, with practitioners who might be equally kind of bang and in a crazy scientific way, and equally vulnerable to expert challenge. <laughs> well, that's an excellent question, and I always think about the contest between our com the intellectual competition between different uh, experts of different kinds of knowledge. And I can feel or I can sense that competition in all of astrological fields between astrologers and the physicians. Astrologers in their annual predictions usually tell really negative remarks about physicians, saying that okay, their uh, guidance in medical matters or their suggestions for using drugs will turn bad for your health. Uh, this makes me think that there is a kind of competition between physicians and astrologers, and another. Evidence for that competition is an interesting story of an astrologer who was at the court of Bayezid's son. He was a competent astrologer and he was serving his astrological service to the, 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 the prince. But then he realized that the prince's interest shifted from astrology to medicine. And so the astrologers interest also shifted from his college. So he wrote, composed treatise in medicine and presented to the prince just with the hope of being employed in the higher echelons of the prince, the, the prince the court. So the preferences and tastes of the patterns are so decisive, I, I think, and in, in the uh, intellectual pursuits of uh, these individuals. And the competition among different practitioners of different sciences is also important, uh, as you rightly raised. But this is the only uh, evidence I can present from the Ottoman uh, context. I don't find anything, any competition between the historians or chroniclers and the uh, astrologers. Uh, I can't detect the sources. Physicians, you see. That's, that's true. <laughs> I, I, I think the same thing with the physicians. That's um, who Abhimanshu references the most. Or uses medicine as an analogy for how um, astrology works. But he also says that astrology is better than medicine. So I don't know if there is some of that same kind of competition going on. But he's definitely saying astrology is better because of its source. The source of knowledge comes from up there, which is better than anything down here. And, and so that's definitely something that he is talking about. But I mean, part of it, it might just be hyperbole because he's saying astrology is way better than anything else you could possibly do with your life. <laughs> so, I mean, that's it. And you almost get to that point where it's like, it's not only better than astronomy, it's also better than medicine, and it's better than everything. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that the perhaps important in this context is to discuss only the things strictly within the terms of the Aristotelian concept of science. And I think that is really crucial. I mean, and what characterizes this Aristotelian concept of science is that we have certain knowledge, that the knowledge is theoretical and not practical, that knowledge provides um, an entertainment that, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, satisfaction. And that the, that the object of, of knowledge is somehow sublime and effective. For example, in Aristotle, we have the defense of the study of biology because he was afraid that people would say, well, animals are so ugly 
then one should better, better study them, rather study astronomy because there we can see the eternal movement of the divine and celestial bodies. So this is actually the framework in, in which we, we have to, to study and to interpret also the discussion about the value of astrology, also the Kegel, also the Deleuzean in the last world, perhaps if you want to put it like that, because we have to be aware not to read into these discussions post Baconian concepts of science, the capability of science, science is a means to, to, to do things, because paradoxically, we are speaking about the technological status of astrology, it was a problem of astrology that it was practical. It was a problem of astrology. So, so all the, 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 the way how, how, for example, the Masher insists, and that you have also said this in your, in your paper, that it's more practical than astronomy, is actually more a problem. So actually what, what Abu Mashar also does in his, in his introductory uh, chapters is actually to argue against what he's doing in the rest of his book. That he, for example, says, well, but in fact, the, the object of astrology is more sublime than, for example, the object of medicine, because medicine is dealing with this vile human bodies. And it all is going on there. And astrology, astrology actually explains the, the, the mechanics or the theory of the functioning of the world as a whole. So, so what, what I'm trying to say is really that all these discussions we really have to be very careful not to read into these defenses modern terms, but really thinking it from, from the background of uh, the astrological concept of science. I think that it's very, very crucial for the not to fall into trust. Managers. 
I, I don't see any. I mean, there are, of course, some Munadjins who were sons of uh, prominent Munadjins, but it's not always normal. Okay. 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 Um, you mentioned earlier in the paper that the work was composed and Not, not particularly. It's very, it is very Aristotelian, um, as, as, uh, oh my goodness, my mind is just going away. I forgot your name. Raymond. <laughs> Who was? Raymond. Raymond, sorry. <laughs> as uh, Raymond was mentioning that we're seeing in this Aristotelian context, and he uses a lot of Aristotelian arguments in his, in his defense. Um, and he uses Ptolemy, but he's, he's really, a lot of his, he only cites a few people specifically, and those are all Greeks. So he does Parkes and Ptolemy, and he actually mentioned Thalen once. Like it's, he's not going into, he doesn't mention any um, Pahlavi sources or anything like that, although it seems unlikely that he wouldn't have been at least somewhat influenced by all of those people that he grew up around. But at least in his defense, he is not. He is basically sticking with the, these new, new translated. But he doesn't mention any Jewish Christians. No, he doesn't. The only, the only people that in his defense that he mentions specifically are Ptolemy, Aristotle, which he just calls the philosopher. He doesn't even say his name. Uh, <laughs> Galen and Parkes. Those are the only ones. Uh, produced by 
the experts from the science of the stars. Speaking of the technology, it's trying to say that the oldest surviving part of this is 1594. Which, of course, in history of astronomy, is probably the right on the cusp of the biggest instrumental change in this particular. And it just wants me to ask, well, do these, is, is there a, a, a notion that astrology is getting better and worse? And is there an argument for how, not just do we do it, but how do you organize it such that it might get better? I never found in the treatises that I read such kind of discussion about the advancement of technology and we should use this kind of uh, tools or we should make or manufacture these tools in order to have better calculations. Or, uh, I, I unfortunately couldn't find any, any such discussion uh, in the treatises that I looked at. And maybe in the 17th century texts there are such implications which I should look at <laughs> after I did that my dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> but for the treatises I'm particularly interested in, I couldn't find such. Is that that maybe the place? Yeah, it was not like that, but I, I also put out that actually that would reinforce the, what we were talking about before, the artificial character mm -hmm. of the community. Because mm -hmm. I think. As far as I know, there are no practical treatises on talisman production which uh, use more, more modern technology. I mean, they were also to render these, these treatises rather practical. I mean, not really. I mean, if you have these, these rather small texts where you say, well, under the center of this star, you have to produce it like that, you have to get and so on. These were treatises used by, by, by either professional musicians or by. by and I think that, that was never their interest really to make these things too complicated. I mean, you would not expect a medical doctor really to consult astronomical tables in order to use the correct talisman uh, for a certain I really doubt that the process of mathematicalization of mathematicalization, which uh, your treatise actually uh, calls for, is something which really reflects any kind of reality. At least I'm not aware of any. A practical text about talisman language which would in any respect be uh, confirmed such a development. I mean, it would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I found this manuscript quite interesting. You, yeah. Yeah. You, have, you have those kind of traces of this mathematization or better uh, calculation of certain uh, astronomical uh, phenomena. But he never goes into detail or into specifics. I mean, he just points to those things, but he then refrains from talking in detail about those things. Because I have a suspicion that it does not reflect the kind of historical process of uh, improvement of astrology or improvement of astrological practices. Mm -hmm. That would be my suspicion that uh, anyone has to check it. Are you right? It's the here. Uh, I mean, this is something I 
sorry to think about after your presentation yesterday, so it's maybe too early for me to just <laughs> give an exact answer for the differences between mathematicalization and mathematicization. Uh, taxonomy of sciences uh, and the way they put different sciences into clusters of natural sciences, physical, uh, mathematical sciences, or then metaphysical or theological sciences. Uh, I don't know much about the dynamics behind you know, how the sciences were classified by different actors and different theoreticians. So unfortunately, the Ottoman uh, case doesn't say much about uh, you know and Tashio Pizada, for example, just repeats in the advance, you know, uh, examining the science of the, And we need more in case studies about how different uh, men of knowledge, because there are numbers of examining the science books that are that's the way that we research and the force. But I'm not in a position now to just. Uh, Would you say it is a little bit more conservative than we so far? That's what I said. See, on the basis of the actual piece out there, you just repeat the classical, you know, categories in terms of. listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.